Hello and welcome to Hellfire Peninsula, formerly a hot and humid region known as Tanan Jungle. Draenor's destruction rendered it this horrible wasteland full of sadness and death. Anyway, after covering the prelude in part one, which you should go watch if you haven't already, we're going to go over the broad strokes of each zone, blending elements from the Burning Crusade, Warlords of Draenor, and my own ideas and headcanons. Details will be sprinkled in when I feel indulgent, but let's get on with this, shall we? If you enjoy this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and drop a comment telling me your favourite piece of lore. Assembled in the previous video, our gang of heroes, plus the adventurers, work to gain a foothold in Outland. They've taken the Stair of Destiny, slain the Pit Lord Commander, and taken out the teleporters so the demonic forces trying to invade Azeroth are cut off from their immediate reinforcements. As we make our way to Honor Hold, we get commentary between Tyrion and Ural about the path of glory being paved with the bones of slain Draenei. Tyrion expresses shock because he thought the stories regarding what was on the other side of the Dark Portal were just that, stories. But Urel haltingly remarks that what happened here is all too real. Safang gravely comments that this is why his people execute warlocks wherever they find them. In this version of the game, while orc players can be warlocks, every class quest for orcs puts a heavy emphasis on secrecy and takes place far from any city or settlement. It's never about power, but about knowing your ultimate enemy as an orc, the Burning Legion, so you can overcome them. In that respect, orcish warlocks in the Horde have a similar point of view as demon hunters. Which means we don't have the bizarre situation of anti-old Horde spiritual reawakening shaman Thrall somehow approving of warlocks just hanging out below Orgrimmar. Excuse me, what? It's worth noting that the Felblight exists in this version of the Peninsula, a river of demonic runoff spilling from the throne of Kil'jaeden into Nan Jungle. It runs down funnels that bracket the Path of Glory and forms a moat around the Citadel. We reach Honor Hold only to run up against the shell-shocked veterans within, who see anyone who isn't originally from the expedition as the enemy, either Horde or agents of the Burning Legion. The gang is driven away and sets up camp nearby, where they discuss their options. Dark Ranger Laurelin notes that there's a post outside the hold where a disgraced member has been strung up and left to die of exposure, which the player is sent to investigate with her. We find Scout Helen Farley, a human woman exiled from Honor Hold for sedition. We bring her back to the gang where Urel and Liadrin tend to her wounds, and she explains that Danath Trollbane is to blame for the hostile welcome. The years following Draenor's destruction were not kind, and by the time Illidan's lot came and closed the demonic gateways, Danath was riddled with paranoia and cruelty. He saw enemies everywhere, to the point where he even began to mistrust anyone who wasn't human, and took to worshipping the Light in a manner not dissimilar to the Scarlet Crusade. This eventually led to a schism years ago, with a good chunk of their forces, including all the non-humans, fleeing to Terrakar and Shatroth City in search of better allies. Working with Scout Farley's knowledge of the area, the gang removes pressure on Honor Hold by weakening the Felorks at Zeth Gore, the demons in the Path of Anguish and Felspark Ravine, and settling the restless spirits of the Expedition Armory, things the Hold was unable to deal with on their own because of Danath's single-mindedness and isolationism. Farley shares her frustrations throughout all of this, admitting that she'd given up hope of anything getting better. She's especially bitter about the events of the Armory, recalling what happened when the old Horde Death Knights tore through the area and butchered their comrades, and all of the nights she spent staring at their spectral echoes wandering, trapped and tormented. She remarks that she doesn't know where the other Death Knights ended up, but the first one, Terran Gorfiend, is still around and serves Illidan now. She swears that some night she saw him walking amongst the ghosts, like he was taunting them. With pressure lifted, the gang has the space to assault and take over on a hold, confronting Danath Trollbane inside the keep. Danath curses them as demons and mongrels, forsaken by the light and fit only for the flames. He's especially vicious towards Scout Farley, accusing her of corruption. Tyrion, previously excommunicated and shunned by his allies for saving the life of the orc Aetrig years ago, tries to talk Danath down. He argues against the distrust Danath has for the non-humans that make up the rest of his team, and when Danath focuses his ire on Sarfang, Tyrion argues that not all orcs are alike. They are as capable of good and evil as any human. However, backed by a legacy of troll murder and with 20 years of demonic horrors weighing on him, Danath refuses to bend, resulting in his death at the hands of the adventurers. <laughs> Tyrion regrets that it came to this, but quickly takes charge of the situation to get them organized and begin getting supplies and reinforcements routed to the hold. Danath's remaining forces are either cut down or surrender so they can finally go home, with a few accepting the new status quo under Scout Farley's direction. 
Now that we're situated at the hold, Farley explains that the Illidari initially left them alone, neither helping nor harming them as long as they stayed out of the way. But that changed recently. Something has gone horribly wrong with the Triumvirate ruling Outland. Illidan and Kael'thas aren't communicating, but Vash still appears to be on Illidan's side. Liadrin asks what happened to make Kael'thas pull back, but Farley confesses ignorance and suggests investigating Falcon Watch, a Blood Elf outpost far to the west. Farley goes on to explain that the city of Shatrath is where the free people of Outland have congregated, and that Khadgar can be found there. Last she heard, he was helping coordinate the resistance against Illidan's lordship. Tyrion makes plans to head to Shatrath once reinforcements from Azeroth arrive, and turns their focus on the most immediate problem, Hellfire Citadel. This leads to the group performing strikes on Ramparts, Blood Furnace, and eventually killing Doom Lord Kazakh at its centre. See, the Dark Portal opening is all because of him and some unspecified unknown relic, but he's relegated to a meme screaming from a nearby mountain in canon, so instead Kazakh replaces the Magtheridon's lair raid. The Fell Orcs at Hellfire were initially under Illidan's command, but Kazakh took over and began making his own shock troops. It turns out ruling through might and fear makes your soldiers susceptible to a bigger, scarier master, stealing them away while you're distracted. The important thing here is that, for the sake of the story, all of these dungeons have a solo mode, where the player is backed up by plot-relevant NPCs. Magtheridon's Lair is now a prerequisite raid beneath Black Temple, with Keladan the Breaker and his Council of Shadowy Sorcerers serving as an encounter before him. Shattered Halls has also moved to be a part of Black Temple instead, as another prerequisite instance to weaken Illidan's shock troops. In Hellfire Ramparts, we assault the outer defences of the Citadel alongside the rest of the gang, removing their commanders and uncovering documents that point towards the power struggle that took place between Illidan and Kazak. In Blood Furnace, we find the same horrible experiments being conducted on captured orcs with demon blood, only this demon blood is from Kazak instead of Magtheridon. Sarfang is both horrified and relieved to see that uncorrupted orcs have survived in Outland, and discovers where to find them through rescuing these prisoners. The last boss is a horrible result of the Fellblood experimentation, like a cross between Gurtog from Black Temple and the blood abominations found in Nazmir. Finally, there is a short raid to confront Doomlord Kazak, fighting through his honor guard with the gang. This also has a solo mode for story completion, as will all the other raids. With Kazak's defeat, the player would be treated to a cutscene in the style of Warbringers. We'd see the demon's demise as he laughs, mockingly telling us that he will return one day to watch Azeroth burn. It fades to black, and we see Illidan brooding within his personal chambers, sitting and barely illuminated by firelight. He seems to be in pain and stumbles when he stands, falling to his knees with a hand to his chest. A crackle of arcane magic sweeps over him, and the illusion falls away, revealing a deathly, almost ghoulish appearance, with a faint blue glow emanating from beneath his hand. There is a long diagonal scar across his chest, twisted and necrotic looking, the edges of it glow with a frigid light. Illidan experiences a flashback to his duel with Arthas, remembering the mockery Arthas threw at him throughout, and the threats of Kil'jaeden afterwards. He snarls and pushes to his feet in time for Vash to enter his chamber, telling him that there's been a new development in the peninsula, and it fades to black again. From this point, the rest of the zone opens up, and outlying quest chains pick up story threads for our team. With Sarfang, we follow up on the rescued orcs from Blood Furnace and make contact with the hidden Maghar up in the northern mountains. Here we see Flora from Tanan Jungle sheltered in a wet ravine, where shamanism and other magics rooted in nature are used to preserve this snapshot of what the peninsula used to be. Both Earthcaller Raiga and Captain Gorkan Bloodfist recognize Sarfang, bringing up painful memories for him. To his shame, he admits that he was among the first who voluntarily drank the demon blood, foolishly trusting the poisoned words of Gul'dan over the dire warnings of their shaman. Raiga elaborates that many shaman tried to warn against what was happening, but one by one they ran afoul of some accident or illness, and eventually they stopped speaking up. The shaman who survived either fell in line or went into hiding, usually taking children with them to protect them from being forced into service. Sarfang asks if there are others, but before Gorkan trusts him with that information, he wants Raiga to test Sarfang's spirit, to see if the people of this so-called new horde have truly left their demons behind. Through this ritual, we see Sarfang struggle with the weight of the things he did under the influence of the demon blood. He is grief-stricken and horrified and ashamed, but overcomes the ritual with a defiant bellow of never again. 
Satisfied, Gorkan tells him that their people survive in Nagrand. This is what takes Sarfang there, and he sends word to Thrall confirming that he's found their lost kin. Leadrin investigates Falcon Watch, the Blood Elf outpost to the far west, and we get the immediate sense that something isn't right. They don't seem to trust her. We walk in on a conversation between Arcanist, Kalethris, Stormstar, and Prince Kaelthas, discussing the new power source they're researching in Netherstorm. Kaelthas expresses surprise at Liadrin's arrival, and at her questioning why they haven't heard from him in months, he smoothly reassures her that he's been absorbed in his work, their people need salvation, and he's getting close to finalizing a real solution for them. He only needs a little more time. He orders her to return to Azeroth and await further instructions, brushing off concerns about the Legion, and cuts the conversation short. This doesn't sit right with Liadrin, and after some careful probing around the outpost, she and the adventurer recover troubling documents. Regrouping away from the outpost, Liadrin reads through these documents. They contain talk of weapons testing in Terrakar and a seething hatred for the traitors in Shatrath City. Before Liadrin can read any further, the Arcanist's men find us and attack, trying to stop us from uncovering what exactly is going on. This is foiled, of course, and Liadrin tries to keep one of the attackers alive to get more answers out of him. Unfortunately, his wounds are too severe, and he spits out an ominous warning as he dies. We are thrice damned, Matriarch. Liadrin is left deeply suspicious and parts ways, needing time to think. Yurel finds a group of escaped broken sheltering in the temple of Telhamat. One of them recognizes her, an old friend from before the war, and that friend tells her that her sister Samara is alive. This surprises her, as she was sure Samara perished during the slaughter at Shatrath, and in the chaos afterwards, it just wasn't safe to go looking. The guilt has gnawed at her ever since, but if Samara is indeed alive, then Yurel will do all she can to keep it that way. We fight to free the rest of the slaves from a dig site where Illidan's demonic taskmasters are searching for old Draenei power cores. To what end, we don't know for sure, but NPC Chatter reveals that Illidan has grown increasingly concerned about his safety and seems to be seeing enemies everywhere. After killing the site overseer and freeing her sister, Yurel gets a tearful reunion and learns about the Kuranai in Zangamash, which is where she heads next. Varisa and Dark Ranger Laurelin's quest takes place around On a Hold after it's taken over by the Azerothian team. They question those who remain about where Alaria and Turalyon have gone, and get only half-remembered details that point to locations in Terracar, Blades Edge Mountains, and finally Netherstorm. Arator is mentioned briefly because Varisa practically raised him after Alaria disappeared and would not allow him to come with her on this mission, instead trusting him to watch her sons. She also shares a bit of insight into Sylvanas when she was alive, as Verisa wistfully comments Sylvanas got to be the fun aunt Verisa couldn't as Arator's surrogate mother, and that was one of the few times Verisa saw her genuinely smile back then. We find Warden Ambulance near an old Night Elven campsite built amidst a darkened thicket connecting Hellfire to Zangamarsh. This area replaces Fallen Sky Ridge, retaining some of the jungle-like growth that used to thrive all over Tanan due to Zangamarsh's proximity, but in a sickened state. The camp is shrouded in mist and shadows, wisps wander through the canopy, and there are skeletons resting half-buried in battered armor. A maddened Ancient of War patrols, and we help Ambulance put it out of its misery, allowing us to dig through the camp and uncover clues as to where Maiev has gone. Ambulance speaks half to herself as we search, remarking that she should have been there, but that she won't fail Maiev again. She comments that it was so easy for Taranda and the rest to forget about the prison, to lock away the worst of their society underground and out of sight. The Bower prison was just for Illidan at first, but it grew over time and for 10,000 years they did their duty. They lived most of their lives underground, isolated and with only each other for company. Many of those women she and Maiev knew for thousands of years. Amberlance bitterly cuts herself off and leaves for Zangomarsh. The clues point that way. And with that, we are done with Hellfire Peninsula. The other zones should be a little shorter, since we won't have story threads for the entire team to cover, but I hope you enjoy them nonetheless. Thank you for watching, please take care of yourselves, and I will see you next time.